We're here today to talk about death, taxes, and politics. Uh, the lead up to the 2024 election has us thinking about the 2017 Tax Act and future tax policy. My name is Patrick Duffy. I'm a partner in the firm's Tampa office. And it's a private wealth services group. I'm joined uh, by Brett Marcelli, who is a partner in the firm's uh, Portland office, uh, also in the private wealth services group, and also by Josh Odens, um, who is a partner here in the Washington, D.C. office, advises clients on uh, tax matters, including tax policy. So, Josh, Brent, let's talk. Thank you for having us here today. Thank yeah. you for having me. Um, the 2017 Tax Act, 2024 election, the way the timing lined up, not coincidentally, I think we're, we're looking at both uh, together. An inseparable unit in some ways. Um, but, you know, with the 2017 Tax Act, there were a lot of provisions, uh, not the corporate tax cut, but a lot of provisions that are going to sunset. Um, one of the most relevant to our clients is the exemption exclusion amount. But I think there's more there. There, there, there is more there. Um, but, you know, I mean, starting with the, the exemption exclusion amount, Right now, our clients or, or all taxpayers enjoy about a $13.6 million per person estate and gift tax exemption. It's scheduled to increase by an inflation adjustment next year. We don't have that inflation adjustment figure yet, uh, but under current law, as of January or after December 31, 2025, the exemption will sunset and it, for rough numbers, we're expecting it to be cut in about half down to, you know, call it $7 million per person. So there's there's certainly this element of kind of use it or lose it. We know that the exemption will go away. Um, we are counseling and encouraging clients who have the ability to do so, to do some planning now while we know the that the high exemption is available to them so that we are prepared, even if we're not yet pulling the trigger on you know, making gifts at this exact moment, what we're encouraging our clients to do, a lot of our family office clients, is have the infrastructure in place so that when it is time to, to implement the plan, we're able to do that efficiently in advance of any, you know, upcoming potential tax law changes. Because I believe already this year, it, understanding, you know, this is, of course, an election year, so it might not, probably will not go anywhere, but there is a bill out there that would propose to accelerate the sunset to after December 31, 2024. So, you know, word of, of caution to our clients has been to be proactive and try to implement some of these plans sooner than later. So don't pull the trigger, but you're ready. To pull the trigger. Exactly. Now, what about on the family office side? The actual family office. So on the actual family office side, what, what we've really seen over the last you know decade plus is this tremendous rise in popularity and assets under management of family offices in you know the US and abroad. But focusing you know here in the US on single family offices, you know, we've seen the the number and assets under management of U.S. single-family offices, you know, doubled effectively over over the last 20 years. Um, and a recent uh, report came out from Deloitte projecting that U.S. family offices by 2030 will have four trillion in assets under management. I think it's you know in excess of 5.4 trillion for a worldwide basis, which will put family offices at or as projected family offices will have a higher asset under management level than hedge funds. So they are absolutely going to be going to continue to be a significant player in this space. And the, you know, the, there are tax and non-tax reasons why we have seen such a proliferation in, in family office structures. Um, you know, the non-tax reasons are, are not going away. They're going to continue to be relevant They're That's, Everything from, you know, customized investment portfolio structuring, you know, kind of gone are the days of turning over the entire family's asset net worth to a single private bank or, or asset manager. Um, families at, at this level, and, and typically we think of at a minimum $100 million net worth for structuring a new family office. Um, and oftentimes, you know, many more than that. I think the average 
U.S. family office right now has two billion assets under management and employs a staff of like 15 people. Um, so there's there's a strong strong desire in this segment of of our clientele for very bespoke unique planning that you know they they don't want a product pushed at them. They want the ability to have someone in house really vetting the opportunities available to them and putting the family and their long term you know, prospects and goals at the forefront. Um, and kind of to that end, you know, one of the unique things that we've long been seeing in, in family office structuring is kind of gone are the days of the 60, 40, you know, stock to bond portfolio, right? Um, and I think right now in the U.S., about 46% of family office assets are invested in some form of alternative investment structure, you know, largely private equity and hedge fund, but also, an increasing number of direct investments by by family offices, um, and, and again, all of the all of these non tax justifications, I, I think, continue regardless of what may happen with the 2017 Tax Cut and Job Act. Um, the the TCGA did, however, do a couple of things that that also helped to to expand the family office planning. Um, Pre-2017, prior to the 2017 Tax Act, you were able to deduct miscellaneous itemized expenses under Section 212 for, for the production of income. The 2017 Tax Act did eliminate that. And, and that, in conjunction with a, a very tax favor, taxpayer favorable ruling in the Lender Bagel case, did help kind of you know provide a roadmap and, and provide some additional um, benefits for these family office structures because in lieu of looking at the Section 212 expense, a properly structured family office operating as a trade or business may be eligible for deductibility of expenses paid through the family office under Section 162 as just a, a trade or business expense. Um, I mean, it's well beyond the scope of our discussion today to get into all of the nitty gritty on how we structure that. Um, but, you know, for, for our purposes here today, it is important to know that the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act did help popularize this trade or business structure, you know, operating the family office as a true business with a profit motive and profit incentive. Um, but, I, you know, the, the question has been raised by, by others after the 2017 Tax Act does sunset and we we have the ability again to deduct miscellaneous itemized expenses under 212 for the production of income. The question has come up, are family office structures going to continue to be relevant? And, and I think one, the whole host of non-tax reasons argue very, very strongly in favor of yes. But two, the tax rationale also argues in favor of, of the continued relevance and growth of family offices because you know, pre-2017, prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, we had significant hurdles in structuring, you know, in deducting investment advisory fees and, and the types of expenses that are often paid through the family office. Um, you know, I mean, namely under Section 67G, you had the 2% floor. So you had to have those expenses exceed 2% of AGI to, you know, to make them deductible above that threshold. But also when the, when the 2017 Tax Act does sunset, we're going to have the return of the AMT in, in full force. And what that's going to mean is that a majority, a vast majority, all maybe of, of family office clients are going to be subject again to the, to the full brunt of the AMT, rendering them unable to take those deductions. So really we are, we are going to remain, I think, in a scenario where, to do this type of planning effectively and to achieve the desired tax result, which is deductibility in, in many cases, you're going to, I think, still need the full family office structure where you're in your family office as a true recognized trader business with a profit motive so that you can enjoy the tax benefit of some of those deductions. So the 2017 Tax Act ends up just phasing out. Yep. What I'm hearing is your reporting is going to change. Some of your consequences are, are going to change. But at the end of the day, your structure is not going to need to change. And that's true even if you're starting your family office in 2026. 
That that's correct. Yeah, and I mean, I think the the way I look at it is, even if we have the sunset of of some of the exempt or some of the provisions of the 2017 Tax Act, the way that we have come to now structure family offices to to be eligible for the, that that does not the the fact that we might now have the return of the 212 itemized deductions does not, in my mind, alleviate the need for sound family office planning, structuring those management companies as operating trades or businesses. Okay. So, Josh, on the subject of the 2024 election, sitting here early September, I uh, <clears throat> went ahead and I checked the betting markets. And uh, they imply, roughly, a coin flip at the White House, a coin flip in the House, and a 60 to 65% chance of the Republicans taking back the Senate. What does that look like to you from a tax policy perspective and maybe even just take a step back from a political perspective? Yeah, so I think if one party controls all the levers of government, it makes it a lot easier to pass legislation and specifically tax legislation. Uh, Congress would use reconciliation to bypass the 60 vote threshold in the Senate of winning filibusters. So as long as one party controls, then there's an easier path for tax legislation. It gets more tricky if we have divided government. Okay. You mentioned filibuster and reconciliation. That was ultimately how the 2017 Tax Act got passed. Correct. But coming from uh, the 90s, a child, as a child of the 90s, my experience was uh, Schoolhouse Rock, when a bill becomes a law, um, that is not exactly how uh, that works. So, also as a child who grew up listening to Schoolhouse Rock, you know, <laughs> that is not how it works. There's a little asterisk for reconciliation. So, uh, it, it, reconciliation is a budgeting rule that allows a party to either uh, to pass legislation with a simple majority in both houses for spending revenue or debt limit. There are some limitations, including one, the bill cannot exceed whatever metric they set for by way of spending or revenue uh, in the 10 year window. And then outside the window, the bill cannot cost any additional revenue. It could raise revenue outside the window, but it cannot lead to a deficit outside the window. So you increase taxes net. Yes. Can't decrease net outside the window. Correct. And that's why we have a sunset of half of the provisions in 2017. So that's right. Okay. It's purely budgeting. So I thought it might be constructive, uh, right, if we talked to Josh about how that worked as a practical matter with some of the uh, proposals we've seen on the campaign trip. Uh, the first one, uh, and this started, I think, with President Trump, but has some level been adopted by Vice President Harris is no tax on tips. So what do we think that looks like under those strictures? Uh, and assume, by the way, that, you know, even though it's being proposed by both, the party who, uh, who doesn't win would be in opposition to it. That's correct, right. And so let's assume one party has all the levers. I think they use reconciliation to exempt tips from income tax, but they cannot exempt tips from SECA and other ends the payroll taxes because payroll taxes, uh, like so anything that goes to Social Security is outside of reconciliation. And, and so these are what we would think of as the, the trust fund taxes. Right? Exactly. If I'm a waiter or a waitress, I hear no tax on tips. But as a practical matter, probably most of the taxes that I'm paying on those tips would be under fine. As a practical matter, that is correct. And so at the end of the day, it may not mean much to those who are paid by tips, although we might decide to take some of our income as tips. We'll, uh, we'll work on that in the engagement letters. Um, okay. Brett, we were talking earlier about uh, some of the Harris proposals, right? Yes. Yeah, so one of the Harris proposals that we've seen is this concept of raising the corporate and or capital gain rates to 28%. And we were curious to get your thoughts on, you know, how that might work under a reconciliation process. You know, obviously it's a it's a tax increase. There's no 
there's no reduction there. So is that something that if the votes are there could be permanent? And and where do you see the Republican Party's you know kind of pressure points to to Harris proposal along those lines? So let's assume Democrats run the table and control both houses in the White House. I expect there will be a corporate tax increase. President Biden has campaigned on this issue. It's been in the Green Book. Vice President Harris is running on the issue. Richie Neal, uh, if he's chairman again of Ways and Means, has expressed an interest in raising the rate to 25%. Ron Wyden wants to raise the rate to 28%. So I think the corporate rate will go up. It also raises between 100 and 120 billion dollars a year for each 100 basis point increase in the rate. So it's a fairly easy raiser, and it's easy to explain to the to the population. Uh, Capital gains is a little trickier. Uh, and so if it's Democrats, uh, yes, they're looking to increase taxes on high net worth individuals. Uh, maybe they'll do something like the NIT and uh, just a, an increase that way that instead of 3.8%, it'll go up to an even number, 8% maybe. Um, so that would hit the right caliber of, of individuals that Democrats might target. It's a little harder to predict what Republicans will do uh, if, let's say, they control all the levers of government. We have a very different Republican Party than we had back in 2017. In 2017, uh, Chairman Brady and Hatch were pro-business Republicans. They were very focused on getting the rate down, building out a territorial tax system. Um, they were also concerned about the capital gains rate and making sure it, it stayed low. Um, the, so. Both Hatch and Brady have retired from Congress, and we have effectively a brand new Republican Party at Ways and Means. There are only two members at Ways and Means who were there in 2017, and several of the real big thinkers from 2017 on the Senate side have retired. So what does that mean? Uh, they might make different deals, and I would expect pressure to raise the corporate rate to pay for other things, including keeping the rate down on high net worth individuals, uh, perhaps expanding the deduction for pass-throughs. So I think there'll be, uh, there might be some interest in raising the corporate rate a few percentage points, despite what uh, Donald Trump says on the campaign trail. And obviously former President Trump has been a bit mixed in his messaging. He said he wanted to bring the rate down to 20%, then he didn't say anything about the corporate rate. And then he said, well, we'll bring it down to 15% so long as the corporate entity does something in the United States, in other words, produces in the United States or conducts the services out of the United States. So uh, perhaps some type of export subsidy. So I think we're still waiting to see what uh, what campaign, what candidate Trump wants. Um, but if he's president and it's Republican Congress, then I think we still could see an increase in the corporate rate. So speaking of exports uh, and also former President Trump, one of his proposals is to, I think, more or less replace the individual income tax with tariffs. Assume for a second that's possible to get to the roughly $2 trillion worth of tariffs that we needed. Uh, what does that look like in the framework of reconciliation? Uh, I think it's very difficult, the framework of reconciliation. So. Once again, reconciliation focuses on tax, uh, spending, and uh, and debt limit. But this is a trade issue, uh, and and so question is, could this fit into revenue? Uh, that would be an issue for the parliamentarian to take on, and specifically the Senate parliamentarian. The House can do whatever it wants on a simple majority. The House is a dictatorship; it's always been. That's how it operates, whichever party's in charge. But the Senate, on the other hand, it will require the Senate parliamentarian to agree that that type of tariff is germane and operates like a tax. So yeah, that's a career government employee? That is a career government employee. She was appointed by uh, Harry Reid in 2012. Okay. And she could theoretically decide the future of the, the you know, tariff slash income tax regime. That is correct. Wow. And she'll get a good book deal afterwards. No uh, stop worldwide trade. Too. <laughs> so we touched on it earlier, but 
you know, the exemption exclude and the exclusion amount that we focus on, John. Uh, right now, it's in the thirteen million dollar range. That's the inflation adjusted amount. So, we be at ten, uh, which then would go down to five plus inflation uh, adjustment uh, under the current terms of the act. Um, Brett, how do you see that fitting into this, given the amount of revenue that's involved. It feels like there might be a little bit of mismatch. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I mean, here's the thing. I think we've, we've talked about this. I think the, the annual, you know, revenue from the estate taxes. Um, right. And we were, to be clear, dealing with $2 trillion earlier. Yes. Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I hate this expression, but it's a relative drop in the bucket. Um, the, the political importance of the estate tax regime is is really outsized based on its fiscal impact. Uh, I do question, and Josh, I'm, I'm always very curious for your thoughts on something like this. You, you know, under current law, all that has to happen for the $13 million or $14 million with inflation perhaps next year adjustment to drop to what we're thinking is going to be a $7 million, give or take, exemption per person, all that has to happen for that 50% sunset to occur is Congress to do nothing. And, and I think one of our, unfortunately, uh, one of one of the things that we've come to realize is Congress can be quite good at doing nothing in this context. Uh, what, Josh, what, what, what is your thought in terms of if the exemption were allowed to sunset, does, did the Republican party, do they potentially have, have more to gain from a, you know, fundraising standpoint by seeing that uh, that exemption decrease to that extent and using that as an ability to say that um, Harris and, and the Democrats presided over the largest tax increase that we've seen? So I think you're assuming a split government in that fact. I am. Scenario, Absolutely. Right? Because if it's unified government, Republicans, have, this is a big issue for Republicans, and they have made it an issue for the last 30 years. Uh, and so they will absolutely retain uh, the exemption. They might increase it slightly, but I think they would retain the exemption and the rate. They might even lower the rate. And actually, on that point, I, I would say we have never seen an exemption, the estate and gift tax exemption, increase and then actually be allowed to sunset to, to yep. prior levels. Yep. And it wasn't that long ago, I mean, earlier in our careers, that we were starting off with a million dollar exemption and a, a much larger percentage of the population being subject to it. Josh, we won't ask what it was at the beginning of your career. <laughs> uh, well, when I was a treasury, uh, there was a year where there was no estate tax. So zero. Uh, 2010. Yep. Yep. But uh, I don't remember because I tend to work with boxes so, <laughs> as in corporations. So I can tell you what the corporate rate was. Uh, but going back to, uh, and, and obviously Democrats have been very focused on addressing uh, tax advantages that high net worth individuals can take advantage of. So I would expect the, the rate to increase for, if Democrats are in control and the exemption to decrease, which would go against history. That being said, uh, if it's with government uh, and if Republicans uh, decide to obstruct and the, then the rate would decrease, uh, the rate, I'm sorry, the exemption would decrease, uh, I think they're playing with fire because it means most likely that taxes are going up for everyone. And while I know we're talking about a very important issue for family offices, the reality is Congress is going to focus on the middle class uh, because that's, frankly, the majority of the taxpayers who will be subject to higher taxes. We have an expanded uh, expanded standard deduction. Uh, we have uh, eliminated PEPs and P's, the different phase outs, eliminated the AMT for most wage earners. Uh, that would all disappear if allowed to expire. And that is uh, a risk. So. Uh, if they were to feel lucky, punk, uh, then it's possible, uh, taking Clint Eastwood's line, that yes, the Republicans could do it and use it as fundraising and blame the Democrats for tax increase. But that is a very risky maneuver. So, 
to kind of synthesize all of this, what I think I'm hearing is if there's an extension, more or less, of the 2017 Tax Act, we're in a world where there's probably been a Republican streak. But that said, some of those changes that you were talking about uh, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the Senate and in the House since 2017 might lead to a different result, even if there's a Republican swing. That is correct. So and I think it's also important to level set how much revenue we're talking about. So if Republicans, say, take a, have all have control of Congress and of the presidency, and they just decide to change the dates on everything in the TCGA, so make no other modifications, that would cost $4.6 trillion over 10 years. Which is substantially more than it did then. That's correct. And it was a $1.6 to $1.8 trillion bill back in 2017, based on Joint Committee on Tax Reason Scoring. So we can, there are other scoring uh, mechanisms and other groups have, you know, tried to count what's called dynamic scoring or the trickle down effect, but Joint Tax scores things with their model based on tax returns. So meaning more or less, I think it would be what, the CBO? The CBO would try their best to say, well, if we tax this less, then maybe people spend more or something like that. Correct. There would be some GDP growth. Okay. That's where CBO adds, but JCT solely focuses on tax changes. So looking at, um, if let's say we were to eliminate the offsets, so allow salt to come back fully, which I, I would like, any of us would like, uh, then if we eliminate all the offsets, that would cost $8 trillion over 10 years. But Taking, uh, bringing back the state and local tax deduction would probably make some uh, folks very happy, particularly in California, some northeastern states. I think so. New Jersey, New York, absolutely. Uh, and and so, but remember, Republicans uh, in this Congress and potentially the next Congress are quite different from the last, from 2017. So the international provisions, for example, were designed by Senators T. Me. Portman and NZ, and they have all retired. Um, and they were pro business Republicans, uh, as in pro multinational Republicans. I'm not sure that's where the party is now. And so they may make some very different decisions about where they want to spend their money. They might, for example, raise the corporate rate a few points to then put the money back into pass through businesses where they've shown a lot of interest. Senator Johnson, for example, created 199 Cap A. The deduction for pastors. So you might decide to put the money there, or they might want to lower the corporate, uh, lower, for example, the capital gains rate, bring up the corporate rate because they think that's the mechanism for collection as a better mechanism. So there's a, a variety of ways that the money could be shifted uh, and still have a bill that costs the same. Josh, you mentioned, you know, kind of the potentially the willingness to raise the corporate rate. Um, I'm just curious how that. If, if at all, how that reconciles with, you know, some of the, the past statements, you know, as part of the 2017 Tax Act, reducing the corporate rate to, to bring us more in line with other, you know, developed industrial nations and make us, the U.S., more competitive on the, the corporate rate. Yeah, uh, things have really changed since 2017, in part because of the OECD and, low, and now level setting to a minimum of 15% tax rate in, uh, in all the countries that have signed up, so the EU, many Asian countries, et cetera. So uh, maybe there is less pressure on that corporate rate on keeping it super low uh, or lower than 21%. Um, and there's mixed messaging from the Republican Party. So we hear, you know, like I said, President Trump has said he would like it, you know, 20% rate or 15% rate. We've heard some Republicans are willing to raise the rate. Um, because frankly, they are from jurisdictions that do not have large multinational businesses, and they work closely with with pastors, and so the corporate rate doesn't benefit their you know, their their base. So I think we talked a little bit about the Harris tax agenda. It feels like, in light of the discussions we had on where the election stands today which is early September, and we were joking uh, earlier that, you know, 
if we had filmed two months earlier, we'd be having a totally different discussion. Um, how likely does it feel to get meaning that meaningful portions of that agenda are going to get past the cycle? Yeah. So if let's assume if there's split government, I think a lot of the Harris agenda will be dead on arrival. Uh, especially the more controversial items. However, some of the items, for example, increasing the ability for small businesses to deduct their expenses, I think that's going to be attractive on both sides of the aisle because that will help startups. And I think they've gone back and forth on the child care credit, right? It feels like they're maybe a little one up solution. Clearly, there is uh, oh, there's a, a huge interest by both parties to expand child tax credit question is how do you do so but so whoever wins will help decide uh, how that debate is has decided but that is certainly there is agreement there as well well that probably brings us to a really good final discussion which is what are compromises um, so i think let's take it where uh i think where trump has prevailed and the, as president senate flipped and the House is flipped, which is a possible outcome. Um, I think uh, if Richie Neal is chairman again, uh, ways and means, uh, he is willing to compromise. He works well with Republicans. He's worked very closely with now Chairman Smith on tax legislation. I would expect uh, Chairman Neal to work closely with the White House and try to reach a compromise. And tax legislation would start there. It has to, it has to start in the House under the Constitution. All tax legislation has to start in the House. However, there's a little asterisk there. As long as the House sends over a House resolution, a House bill, the Senate could strip out whatever is in that bill and send it back with tax legislation. So it will be up to the House to jealously guard their legislation and decide when to send over a bill. Okay. Um, so that I think is a that's easy to see uh, a, a a compromise there, uh, and and clearly uh, you know, we don't know Senator Crapo what his agenda is. He's working on that agenda right now uh, with his caucus, but uh, I I think compromise is doable. It's a lot harder to predict what compromise looks like if Trump loses, and in part because if Trump has control over the party he might enjoy impeding or preventing a tax cut from going through because then it would be viewed as Democrats have raised taxes the most in history. And, and that would, that could help Republicans retake government. Because uh, to Brent's point, that would essentially be status quo, just serve as a blocker. And then you have an effective tax rate uh, or tax increase on probably most of it. Everyone. Yeah. Okay. Almost everyone. Yeah. And so when we're looking at uh, at the different compromise scenarios and, and trying to prioritize things, where do we think things land uh, with if there's a Trump loss? Um, but again, we see pretty likely Senate victory. Uh, Mitch McConnell isn't there. Correct. Matter of fact, we don't know who is going to be the leader. There are three Johns that would like to be the leader in the Senate. Okay, sounds uh, like the start of a poem or a good joke. Exactly, it's a great joke. No, but there are three, uh, John Thune, John Barrasso, and John Cornyn. Thune from South Dakota, Barrasso from Wyoming, Cornyn from Texas. And all three of them have served for you know, many years in the Senate. They're really, you know, institutions. Uh, they're institutionalists in the Senate. But there's also a fourth person who is not named John who would like the role, and that's Senator Daines from Montana, and that's Donald Trump's choice. So clearly the Senate, how it operates, is it going to be, is the leader willing to reach deals, will depend on who the leader is in the next Congress. But Mitch McConnell will not be that leader. Okay. Well, you know, Brent, we were talking a little earlier about, you have the estate tax, and kind of what does that mean for the families that we work with? The exception of exclusion means a lot, but oftentimes that's more of a starting point. I Correct. Think. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's really some of the advanced planning that we can do on top of the exemption 
um, you know, leveraging, you know, discounts for closely held business interests, taking advantage of, of you know, what are still historically low uh, uh, interest rates to effectuate some sale transactions to, to you know, undertake estate freezes and additional value outside of the estate. And, and I think to your point, what might move the needle more for certain clients who have substantial estates where you know, the $26 million exemption between spouses, certainly it is more than a rounding error, but when you're talking some of the, you know, multiple hundreds of millions to $2 billion net worth families, it, it's not a real substantial sum. Uh, what would potentially move the needle more is if there was, you know, allocation of budget to increased enforcement or even, you know, looking at some of the, the old proposed regulations from, you know, 2015, 2016 that, that um, President Trump did, um, did do away with when he came into office for, you know, I think 2703, 2704. So that brings up two interesting points because we're talking about compromise. And of course, we're all really in the back of minds thinking that there's a good chance that instead of compromise, it's just status quo, really doing anything. But in the event that there's a Harris administration, uh, it sounds like they could do quite a bit because you have substantial uh, IRS budget, which was increased by eighty billion, and they're reduced and to sixty. If I'm remembering, 60, yeah. Now, my understanding is most of that was allocated to income tax, but Josh, with the additional funding to the IRS, which we understand is mostly allocated to the income tax side now, couldn't an administration without congressional action? shift the, a lot of that spending over to enforcement of the gift of the state tax side and take some more muscular positions uh, in, within the regulatory uh, aspects? So I'll take the spending first. Um, a lot of that money is actually being spent on technology. Uh, the IRS, until recently, uh, used Fortran and Cobalt as its programming languages for returns, which are languages that are no longer taught in colleges. Uh, so they do need to modernize their systems. And a big focus has been on customer service as well, so that people can actually reach a live voice at the IRS. It would be nice occasionally to talk to someone. Customers in this case meaning taxpayers. Taxpayers or their counsel, yes. Uh, and, and so yes, the IRS, if it got additional funding, could use that for enforcement. I don't know how much they've blown through already of that, roughly $60 billion, uh, but it's not spread evenly over the, the budget cycle. It actually is a user-lose number, so I think they're probably close to half now of, of that number. Um, but yes, the, the IRS could get additional funding. Even if nothing happens, uh, there's an annual fight over how to fund the government, and uh, it's been a priority of... President Biden, I would expect uh, if Harris is president, she would also continue that priority of increasing the size of the IRS. But on the on the flip side, if we did see a, a, you know, a red wave. If it's a red wave, I think we would expect to see uh, two things happen. One is the budget of the IRS to shrink. And second, uh, what budget exists for the IRS, they want more of it should be used for customer service. Uh, because That's over enforcement. Over enforcement. Yeah. So the honey versus a stick. And uh, and so the second piece was- Regulation. Regulation. And that gets into um, a change of the Supreme Court. I think it's the Supreme Court ruling in Loper Bright is a very significant change in how the administrative state is going to operate. We see already uh, you know, prior to Loper Bright, taxpayers were suing the IRS, challenging various regulations. There are a lot of problematic regulations on the international side, and taxpayers have been winning those challenges. So I think the IRS might get skittish about coming out with a fighting regulation. It might be better to audit, uh, as opposed to trying to uh, come out with a very aggressive regulation that may not be supported by the statute. Okay, fair enough. Um, I think we've covered everything for today. We'll look forward to watching everything as it develops over the course of the next few months. Um, thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.